there's still a little bit of topology that we need to review before we talk about the completion of a metric space. And this will help us understand some of the properties of the completion of a metric space. So again, for, for all of um, this video, XD is a metric space. So if I have a subset A of X, I can look at the set of all closed subsets containing A. And I can use that to define the closure of A, which is the smallest closed set containing A. So it's the intersection of B, which is a subset of X, and it contains A, and B is closed. There are many, many other equivalent definitions of the closure of A, and also for what it means for a subset to be closed. And in fact, one of them is a little bit important, so we should say this. A limit point of A is an element x in x such that any ball around containing x intersects A all the time, except near, um, except at x. So more precisely, such that the intersection of any ball of radius r around the point x intersects x, sorry, intersects A, except at x, with non-empty intersection. So just reading this says, just again to make sure it's clear, I take any element in, in a, any, any point in X, and then it's a limit point if every open neighborhood around it contains another element of A that's not X. So X may or may not be an A. It's irrelevant for this definition. I like to think of it in terms of neighbors. This says that a limit point, X is a limit point of A if and only if X always has neighbors in A. And you can show that it's a fact that the closure of A is many, many things, such as the smallest closed set containing A, um, but also it's the union of A with the limit points of A. So now that we know what the closure of a set is, I can actually define what a completion of a metric space is in the case that Cauchy sequences don't converge. And this definition is um, slightly different than uh, what's in your book. So again, if XD is a metric space, a completion of XD is a complete metric space, which we'll denote by X tilde, D tilde. And the reason is because we're going to think of X tilde and D tilde as something bigger than X. With an isometry. So a completion of a metric space is not just a metric space that happens to be complete, but we also need an isometry that takes X and makes sure that it sits inside of this completion. So we have an isometry from X to X tilde. And as we know, an isometry is one to one. So this is a way to map our elements in our initial metric space into one that's complete with respect to that metric. And this is just a way of writing that um, inclusion in some sense. But it's not an inclusion because the set X tilde might actually be different from X. Satisfying the following universal property. Now, what should this property be? So think about it this way. I have an isometry, so it's one-to-one. -one. And in some sense, this is our way of thinking of X as sitting inside of a complete metric space X. We want the completion or a completion 
to be the smallest such metric space that satisfies this condition. In other words, for any other metric space with an isometry from x into it as well, this space should be smaller than that. And the way we make sense of what it means to be smaller is that this should come with an isometry to our imposter complete metric space that also contains x. That's what the following universal property is going to say. So if you write out what all of that actually means, more precisely it says for any other complete metric space z, let's call it z rho, since I don't want to use a, a d, with another isometry, let's say phi from x d to z, there exists a unique isometry from our completion to that imposter. And this is our way of saying that, that our, our completion is the smallest such in, uh, complete metric space. Such that, and we want to make sure that this isn't just any old isometry, it satisfies an important condition. And that condition that it satisfies is that, let's look at all of, let's put all of these maps together. Um, we have xd, we have this isometry to x tilde, d tilde, that's eta, and we also have an isometry from xd to z, and we demand that this h here satisfies the condition that this diagram commutes. So it's our way of saying that the way that x is included in z is the same as the way that x is included in the completion, and that completion ins sits inside of that imposter. So this might sound like a strange definition, but there's a concrete theorem that makes this a little bit more understandable. The upshot of this result is that uniqueness is immediate from this um, universal property, as we've seen for other situations where we've seen universal properties. So the theorem is that a completion always exists for any metric space, and furthermore it satisfies the following condition, that if I take the image of x and I calculate the closure, so I take the closure of x inside of x tilde, it actually equals x tilde. So this is actually a consequence of this universal property. So let's give a sketch of the proof. And the sketch is going to essentially outline what you need to prove to verify these claims. And you'll see that there's actually a lot involved, which is why the actual proof of this theorem is quite long. So first, we have to show existence. And the way we do that is by actually doing something familiar, something that we've done for rational numbers to real numbers. To construct real numbers from rational numbers, we looked at Cauchy sequences of rational numbers. For instance, square root of 2 can be approximated by its decimal expansion, each of which is a rational number. And we define square root of 2 as a certain equivalence class of Cauchy sequences who converge to square root of 2, but we know that we don't have, we don't know what square root of 2 is at that moment. So we're going to do something like that for metric spaces too. So in that regard, we say that two Cauchy sequences, x, y, in x, are equivalent. By the way, for existence, I have to actually construct a candidate for x tilde, so we're going to define x tilde soon. So two Cauchy sequences are equivalent if and only if the distance between these two elements the, the, at the tail end of the Cauchy sequence eventually tends to zero. As we take the limit. 
And then we set x tilde as a set to be the set of equivalence classes of Cauchy sequences in X. We'll denote elements um, like this. So now I have a set and what I have to do after this point is I have to try to define a notion of a metric on this set. So let's define the distance Let's, and let's put a tilde here because this, this is the distance between two Cauchy sequences. Between two Cauchy sequences, X and Y. And remember, these are now functions. We have a number for every single natural, we have a, an element in X for every number, for every natural number. And we define this distance to be the limit of the usual distance. It almost seems like we're cheating. Between the tail ends of the Cauchy sequences. And now here is where we have a lot of things to check. So this is the construction and we have to check that it satisfies all of these conditions, which is a lot by the way. So first claim is that it's not even obvious that detailed is well defined. That's the first thing you have to check. Not only is it well defined, it's a metric. So it satisfies those three conditions of a metric. That's also not obvious. And a lot of these different ingredients are crucial to proving these conditions. Actually, there was one other thing I forgot to construct. I for forgot to construct this isometry. So let's do that. Let's set the isometry eta from x to x tilde to be take x and send it to the Cauchy sequence X, I'll denote this by X bar, where X bar N equals X for all N. So it's just the constant Cauchy sequence that takes a point in X and just repeats it over and over and over again. And the claim is that eta is an isometry. Another claim is that x tilde d tilde is a complete metric space. These are all things you have to check. Another claim is that the closure of eta x is equal to x tilde. And this you show by taking any limit point of this and showing that it's actually, sorry, taking any element here and showing it's a limit point of eta x. And then you have to check this universal property. And the way you do that is, give me another complete metric space with such an isometry. What I have to do is show you that there exists a unique H that fits inside of this diagram. So, Another claim is that H, which is supposed to be defined as a function, let's check here, from X tilde to Z, defined by sending, sending any Cauchy sequence. So let's look at this diagram a little bit. Imagine I have a Cauchy sequence here. This gives me a list of elements if I take an equivalence, if I take a representative. So I get x1, x2, x3, and so on. So I get this huge list of elements. So take one of these and map each of these elements back here. That's, that's what you're thinking of doing, but that's not literally what you're doing because that doesn't make sense, right? There's no map that goes back. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply, oh, this should be, uh, yeah, that's phi. I'm going to apply phi to each of these elements, and that'll give me a sequence in Z. So now that I take, I take these elements and then I apply phi to each of them. Let me write the next one, x2 and so on. That gives me a sequence in Z. The claim is that that sequence is actually Cauchy. That's the first thing. 
And not only that, that sequence converges to something because this is complete. So it's defined by sending x to the limit as n goes to infinity of phi x n. So the claim is that this is well defined an isometry and uniquely satisfies the diagram, let's call this star. So as you can see, there are a lot of things to check to proving this theorem. And as a result, the proof of this theorem is quite long, but each of its constituent parts are relatively straightforward. It's clear to see what the claims are in every single step, and all you have to do is check to make sure that everything is true. And this is sort of unwinding the definitions of what it means to be a Cauchy sequence. And it's going to be similar to the proof that the set of real numbers is the Cauchy completeness of the rational numbers. But this is actually a little bit different, um, and the reason is because in this definition we assume that we already have the real numbers available for us, but the idea of the proof is very, very similar.